Jason W. Morrison, New South Wales, Australia, uh, theologist. Just want to sort that out a bit. Yep. Um, the time is 1.56 p.m., 13th of the April 2011, and we're doing a study on the book of Galatians from jw.org. We're up to chapter 4. Shall we begin? I hope you're enjoying this. It's not an easy book to understand, but doesn't it, doesn't it unravel works for salvation? Now, there's some interesting stuff coming up here. Let's just stay on our game, and here we go. Chapter 4. Now I say that as long as the heir is a young child, he is no different from a slave, although he is the Lord of all things. Now do you know what he's saying there? He's saying you've got it all. You've got it all through what Christ Jesus has done. You have it all. But you be act you're acting like servants because you're trying to make God happy or stopping him from being sad. Just can't you just live and be happy? Oh gosh, this is fantastic. Oh, I've taken it back. Oh, well, let's just do that. Video. Chapter 4. Now I say that as long as the heir is a young child, he is no different from a slave, although he is the Lord of all things. But he is under supervisors and stewards until the day set ahead of time by his father. Well, that day's been done. I don't want you to think that this is pastors or elders or all this stuff. No, 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 no. When Jesus died on the cross, all this was finished with. Now I'm not saying they're not involved in this. This has got nothing to do with them. This has got to do with the finished work of Christ and your relationship with that, not them. Likewise, we too, when we were children, were enslaved by the elementary things of the world. But when the full limit of the time arrived, God sent his Son, who was born of a woman and who was under law, that he might release by purchase those under law, so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now that sounds really uh, com complicated, but it's not. All he's saying is, when the fullness of time had come, God... Now, this, actually, this is really interesting because who was Jesus before he was conceived in Mary? He was the Word of God. There was no Jesus or angel or anything like that before Jesus was born. Jesus was the sound that came out of God's mouth, like the sound coming out of my mouth. And that part of God, via the Holy Spirit, was put in Mary to become the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God became flesh. The only thing that was there before Jesus was the words that come out of God's mouth. And not many people realize this. Jesus was the sound. Well, the, the, Jesus was God. Look, there was God's word. And then when God put his word into Mary's womb to become Jesus, then there was Jesus the man. But there was no Jesus sitting up there or anything like that before Mary conceived and formed Jesus into a human being via the Holy Spirit and the word of God. And when Jesus was born and he spoke, guess whose words were coming out of his mouth? He was the word of God. Hebrews tells us that in Hebrews chapter 1, but we're not going to go there. Look at the other videos if you want to see that. But there was nothing, no angel, no this or that sitting up there before Jesus was born as a man. When Jesus was born as a man, let me just fix this up, make myself a bit decent. When Jesus was born as a man, that was when Jesus became Jesus. But prior to that, he was the sound that came out of God's mouth in brief. That's the best way I can put it. Now, the second part of this is he released the Jews who were under the law from the law. And it's interesting here because this has got a lot to do with what I'm saying. We were never under the law. We just received adoption of son as sons and daughters because we were never under the law. So why put yourself there? My goodness me. Now, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. So the Holy Spirit, again, this borderlines into the Trinitarian doctrines, but if the Holy Spirit's in our hearts and the Spirit of His Son's in our hearts, then the Spirit of the Son is directly connected, if not intertwined, with the Holy Spirit. I mean, they're saying the one and the same here, aren't they? Isn't it? It is. And it cries out, Abba, Father. See, the Holy Spirit, and this is what I'm saying to you again, there's nothing you need to do. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ's Son, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, there you go, there's a Trinity just there whether you want to accept it or not. They're working in us. They're working in us, whether we're conscious of it or not. And we just get too involved. Stay out of it and let them do what they want to do. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are also an heir through God. And just because it's son, says son, it doesn't mean it's not daughters as well, okay? Sons and daughters, okay? And you're already an heir to God through Christ. Nevertheless, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those who are not really gods. But now that you... Now listen for a minute. Listen for a minute. There's an interesting translation thing here. 
you've got God, and then you've got gods. Now, these gods are a form of mindset. These gods were all the different forms of religious practices that were birthed out of people's minds. People were making themselves slaves to what they thought were divine ideas. But they were just human ideas, they weren't God's ideas, and neither were they God. They weren't gods at all, they were just people's mindsets. And this is what you're up against, your mindsets. You have come to know God, or rather, have come to be known by God. How is it that you are turning back again to the weak and beggarly elementary things, and want to slave for them over again? Now this is so interesting, oh my gosh. Talk about hang yourself, watchtower and track society. What he's saying is the finished work of Christ is enough. It's all done and it's why would you turn back? Enslaving to try and make God happy or stop him from being sad when everything's been done in Christ. You are known by God. It's not a matter whether, you know, you've come to know God, but much further and much farther and much more vast in an eternal sense. He's come, he knows you. He already knows you. Why turn back to try and make him happy or stop him from being sad under your God, your mindsets of what you think these gods want? It just goes to show, if really, if you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop you from being sad, you really don't know him at all. I'm sorry, that's just as plain as I can put it. You are scrupulously observing days and months and seasons and years. In other words, what are you scrupulously observing? What are these ideas in your head that are making you think these, that there's things that you need to do to, or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad? Because there's nothing. You're an heir with God. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Now, that's so good because Paul's saying, I've given you everything about Christ and his finished work. I've even met him on the Damascus Road. I was blind, but now I see. You could see, but now you're blind. Just listen to what he says. Brothers, I beg you, become as I am, because I also used to be as you are. What is this? what I said. I couldn't see, Paul's, Paul's saying. I used to be Saul. I was trying to do everything I could to make God happy or stop him from being sad, even murdering people like you. But now I can see. But you're going the other way. If you keep thinking there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're going to start harming and maiming yourselves and other people. You did me no wrong. But you know that it was because of a physical illness that I had my first opportunity to declare the good news to you. So Paul's obviously gotten crook during his missionary journey and pulled in, and he's had the opportunity to write And though my physical condition was a trial for you, you did not treat me with contempt or disgust. So what he's saying is, despite the circumstances, as far as I can see at this stage, nobody is harming or maiming anybody. You're still trying to help people, but underneath it may not be the case. You may be on, you may be, I can't tell who it is, but there's going to be somebody in here that's going to hurt someone if you just keep going down this road. But you received me like an angel of God, like Christ Jesus. Now just let me say, like an angel of God, like Christ Jesus, that doesn't mean Christ Jesus is, was, or ever will be an angel. It doesn't mean Christ Jesus is, was, or ever will be an angel. The Lord, before he became the Lord Jesus Christ, the person, he wasn't sitting up in heaven as Michael the archangel or anybody else or anything else. He was the sound that come out of God's mouth. You have to understand that. Where is that happiness you had? For I bear you witness that, if it had been possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. You see, hanging on to the message of the gospel of grace isn't easy. It slips through the fingers of your mind. Because your carnal nature needs you to be thinking that there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad to get its power. So then, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They are zealous to win you over, but not for a good purpose. They want to alienate you from me so that you may be eager to follow them. This is what this is so important, because people that think you need to do things to make God happy or stop you from being sad, they want to recruit you. They want to keep you under their... They don't want to go down on their own. They don't want to um, be left all alone in the feelings and things that they be going through. So they recruit more people, and, and they've pushed Paul aside to try and make that happen, because he was preaching Christ crucified and lay down your works. However... It is always fine for someone to seek zealously after you for a good purpose, and not just when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again experiencing birth pains until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you just now, and speak in a different way, because I am perplexed over you. It perplexed, and it is perplexing when you think about it, but perplexed Paul 
when he stopped and thought, I've shown them that everything is all right between ourselves and God, but they're persisting in thinking that it's not by the things that they're doing to try and impress God, by the things they're doing or not doing to make him happy, or believing they're making him happy or stopping him from being sad. They're, that's perplexing. And it perplex, it's perplexing. It is perplexing, isn't it? Because it's a perplexing situation. How can it just be so simple and free? And what is freedom? Freedom's anything. You can go and be as free as you want, as long as you're not harming yourself or anybody else. You can be as free as you want. Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not hear the law? For example... See that? The problem was they kept wanting to do something or not do something to make God happy or stop him from being sad. I sound like a scratch letter, a record, don't I? But it's that simple. It's just that simple. If you get it, it'll set you free. The hairs on the back of your neck should be standing up with joy. It is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the servant girl and one by the free woman. But the one by the servant girl was actually born through natural descent and the other by the free woman through a promise. See, it was impossible for Sarai, in normal human terms, to become pregnant, let alone have sex. Um, and before what she'd given up, she thought she wasn't going to have a baby, so she encouraged Abraham to sleep with Hagar, and she brought forth a son under natural circumstances. But there was nothing natural about the way, in, in the miracle that um, Sarah had Isaac. It was totally um, engineered and inspired by the Lord himself. These things may be taken as a symbolic drama, for these women mean two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which bears children for slavery. And See that? Anything you think you need to do or not do, it's Mount Sinai's representative of the law, bears children of slavery. Which is Hagar. Now Hagar means Sinai, a mountain in Arabia, and she corresponds with the Jerusalem today for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, you barren woman who does not give birth. Break into joyful shouting, you woman who does not have birth pains. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than those of her who has the husband. Now you, brothers, are children of the promise, the same as Isaac was. And now he's finally said it, hasn't he? After all that, he's finally said the word Isaac. But just as then, the one born through natural descent began persecuting the one born through spirit, so also now. Nevertheless, what he's saying there is, there will never be peace between the religious people who think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, and the ones that are totally free through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the scripture say? Drive out the servant girl and her son. For the son of the servant girl will by no means be an heir with the son of the free woman. There's no place in real Christianity for our works. There is nothing we can do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. There is nothing we can do. Nothing. We need to fall on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and put our works away, as Paul is describing here. So, brothers, we are children, not of a servant girl, but of the free woman. So let me ask you right now, how free are you? I'll tell you, how free are you? How do you measure your freedom? This is how you measure your freedom, viewers. You're only as free, you can only be as far, go as far in your freedom, right? And this will be a revelation to many of you listening, those who haven't heard this before. You're only as free as far as you can go before you hurt yourself or somebody else. As soon as you start hurting yourself or somebody else, you got no, that freedom is not there. That's not freedom. That's something else. But you can be as free as you want to be as long as you don't hurt yourself or somebody else. And that's where you measure your limits of freedom. It's 2.14 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New South Wales, Australia. This is Dr. Jason W. Morrison. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watch it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.